kick this off, um, talk, you know, I know, talk a bit about sort of about the book, about sort of uh, why you're here, what you're doing. Um, I know, yeah, AJ has kind of a, a short sort of introduction to all that stuff prepared. So here you go. Uh, sure, and thank you, Carmen and, and Rabbi Lightstone and everyone for coming and Rivka for organizing. Uh, I guess the, the quick origin story is I was actually writing another book and I was miserable. I was writing a book for three months and I was just so unhappy. And my agent knew I was a huge puzzle fan because I had done puzzles since I was a kid. I used to make them. Uh, I used to make mazes, like pencil mazes that would be the size of our living room. And, uh, and I also, I think I see the world like Rabbi Lightstone said, as a series of puzzles. Uh, so, in a sense, my other books could be seen as puzzles. So, The Year of Living Biblically was about the puzzle of religion. Or the, the one about thanks a thousand, where I went and I thanked a thousand people who had anything to do with my cup of coffee. That was about the, the puzzle of how do you be grateful in a world where it's often pretty difficult to be grateful. So, uh, I thought, well, maybe I should stop beating around the bush and just go, instead of metaphorical puzzles, just go right to puzzles themselves and see if what I can learn from them, why I love them so much, why do millions of people love them, and also I can print a bunch of puzzles so that <laughs> people can do them. So uh, even if they don't like the book, they can like the puzzles. So that's how it came about. Oh, excellent. So I, I think sort of what jumped out at me about your book is that in, in your book, you are sort of the stand-in for the reader in a way. You're kind of like a, a relatively, you know, a guy of say like slightly above average ability with this stuff. And you decide, I'm going to solve the hardest puzzles in existence. Ones that no one's solved, things that have flummoxed people for years, driven them insane in some cases. Which is to say that this is really almost like a book about sort of finding out your own abilities a book about like the potential for kind of self-improvement. I mean, the idea of like solving even a crossword puzzle is kind of terrifying to me. So I had to sort of kind of talk about the journey that you took to go from kind of who you were at the beginning of the book to the person who is like, like, yeah, I'm going to solve the hardest crossword puzzle that the New York Times has ever published. Or, you know, I'm going to try to solve the absolute hardest, Rubik, you know, Rubik's Cube variant that you know, takes the experts like months or even years to, to crack. Right. Well, first of all, yeah, Armin told me beforehand he is a puzzle, if not a puzzle phobe, maybe a puzzle skeptic, or, or maybe a puzzle phobe. Yeah. So we've got to, over this next hour, we've got to convert Armin to puzzles. That's that's my other goal. Uh, and yet, I, I like that. I do try, in all my books, to just try to be a stand-in for the reader and so with the Bible, like, I knew nothing about it, and, but I was like, I'm going to try to learn everything and bring the reader along with me. So with the same with this. And I had done, uh, I was an okay puzzler. Uh, and, uh, the book opens with an anecdote of uh, how I, I had always loved crosswords. And uh, a few years ago, I was the answer to a clue in the... New York Times crossword. And I thought this was like the highlight of my life. This is like, you know, the holy grail. My wedding was pretty good, but this is like, mm. And then my brother-in-law emailed, and he did congratulate me. I will give him that. But he also said, he pointed out that this was Saturday's New York Times puzzle. And if you know the New York Times, it gets harder every day. And Saturday's puzzle is filled with the most obscure stuff that no one is supposed to know. So his point was, this is not a compliment. This is like, you know, this is proof that you're totally obscure and no one knows, like, in black and white right here. So then I was crushed and I, like, you know, I had a, 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 the emotional roller coaster reached a low point. And I actually told that story on a podcast and it happened that a New York Times crossword constructor was listening and he decided to save me. He did me a mitzvah, he is Jewish, uh, and he put me in a Tuesday puzzle, which is not Monday, 
but Tuesday is still pretty good. Like I do not belong in a Tuesday puzzle set or like Lady Gaga. <laughs> Uh, but I was in there, and uh, and so that was like felt like redemption. Um, but I guess it relates to you know easy and hard puzzles, and and actually sort of the conceit of trying to solve the most baffling puzzles uh, was kind of a conceit because I I don't think a great puzzle needs to be the hardest puzzle, uh, and sometimes those aren't very good puzzles. Like one, one of my puzzle making friends says, it's really easy to make an impossible puzzle that no one can solve. It's finding that sweet spot where you can. But I did, I did love meeting the people who made, you know, wrestled with these hardest puzzles, like the one at the CIA headquarters called Cryptos. It's a, a sculpture and it's got, it's a, a cipher that no one has been able to fully decode it. Uh, but people, there are thousands of people who spend hundreds of hours a month trying to do it, and, and they've been doing it for 32 years. So that's either like one of the greatest wastes of human mental energy ever, or it's an inspirational tale about, you know, the sort of uh, grit and, and persistence. So I'm going to try, you gave me the... Uh, you, you did a good positive spin on something earlier. So I'm going to take your, your point of view and say it's a good thing that these people are still going at. Yeah, that's another interesting thing about the book. And one, one, of the, one of my favorite parts about it is that you meet all of these people who, from the outside who seem like eccentrics who have dedicated themselves just and busting the these hard. And from the inside, they might also be considered a little nuts. And I think my favorite of these people was the guy who was tortured by the Sleeping Beauty problem and spent an hour on the phone with you going into just like almost incomprehensible levels of depth about this. And then in the book it says, if you want to see this memo that he sent me, you can go to my website. If you're really interested, you can read it. Um, well, that was a more, I mean, that interview was one of the bigger moral challenges I've ever had in my career. Because what this is, is, I don't know, does anyone know what the Monty Hall problem is? Everyone, yeah? This is a similar, a uh, puzzle about weird probabilities, and uh, it's called Sleeping Beauty, and it, but it's, it's harder than the Monty Hall problem, and unlike the Monty Hall problem, it's never been fully solved. There are still people debating, is it a third, is it a half, is it some other thing, and there have been a hundred philosophy papers about it, so it could be the hardest puzzle ever created, and uh, so I interviewed a professor who was an expert on it, and he was a he was a third, meaning he believed. And I won't tell you the the you, you can read the puzzle. They hate the halfers. Yeah, they hate the halfers. It's like yeah, sharks and jets. And he, I was like, I kind of see the third, but can you connect me to someone who's a halfer? And so he says, well, call this guy. So I called this guy, and it was bizarre because this guy is super nice, but he had. Um, he was a high school math teacher, and he was obsessed with his problems. And he learned it just three years ago, and he had spent three years, he said, wrestling with it. He said he would spend his day, eight hours a day, staring at the wall, thinking about this problem. And he had written hundreds of pages on it. And he said, and just two weeks ago, I finally decided this is not healthy. And I put... <laughs> Uh, I, I put them all in a rubber band, all my papers, and I shoved them in the closet. And then he said, and then you called. And, I, and now I've taken them out again. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be the guy like, who gives the alcoholic a drink. Like, this is, I, I, feel, I feel very morally uh, uneasy about this. And he's like, no, no, no. You know, you've given me a reason like these three years have uh, finally someone's listening to me. And so I couldn't, I was, I, I couldn't leave him out of the book because then he would feel he had wasted this time. But if I put him in, you know, he's obviously going to seem crazy. Um, but uh, but I, I just wrote it totally, you know, like he said, and and I sent it to him uh, because I'm like I don't want this on my conscience, and you know. But he's like, yeah, I love it. I love being in your book, and. Uh, and 
And then I also put all of his hundreds of pages on my website so you can see his, his theories, which I totally don't understand, but which <laughs> might be brilliant and might be the answer. But my second favorite eccentric in the book um, was the Lewis Carroll scholar who figured out that if you added the number of days that both of the queens in Through the Looking Glass had been alive, that you get the cube of 42, right. which was Lewis Carroll's favorite number. So you, you get both sides of it in the book. You get sort of the delightful, cool, like puzzle-solving eccentrics for whom it's a wonderful thing, and you get the others where it's just kind of this like very interesting, almost dark obsession right. uh, with solving life's mysteries, no matter how seemingly pointless or extraneous they might seem to be. <laughs> Yeah, well, I love that. I think throughout puzzle history, there's been that duality because, you know, I see them as a, as a thing of joy and, and wonderful, but they have always had the other side, too. And uh, one of my favorite parts of history in puzzles is in 1913, the New York Sun printed the first crossword puzzle, and it became a sensation. Hundreds of other newspapers printed crosswords, and there was like a a crossword show on Broadway and crossword songs. And, uh, but there was one newspaper who refused to print it, uh, the New York Times. They thought that it was too lowbrow and it was like, uh, and in fact, instead of printing crosswords, I searched the archives and I found dozens of articles on what a, uh, what a terrible uh, scourge on society crosswords were. Like the articles, and these are totally, you know, I'm not exaggerating. It was like, man kills wife over crossword fight, prison riot over crosswords, uh, athletes neglecting their training because of crosswords. It was like, it was like crack in the 80s. It was like a terrible, uh, you know, just a pestilence. As that was one of the words they used. And uh, and then in 1942, World War II had started, and they felt they they wanted something to distract people, so they they decided to start the crossword. And and now, of course, they've made a 180, and they are like the place for puzzles. And and Wordle, of course, uh, they eventually got them, and and they seem to add new puzzles like every week. It's a huge uh, machine now, and and they're making tons of money. So I love the 180 that they did. Yeah, pu puzzle history is another kind of interesting subplot of the book. We, we, we have a few puzzles in there from very ancient times, um, including a math problem uh, in the rude papyrus from ancient Egypt from 1500 BC. Uh, maybe we can get, this can be sort of the first interactive part of this. You also included a Babylonian riddle from the 5th century right. BCE. Uh, well, yeah, well, let's see if one of you can answer this one. Uh, what becomes pregnant without conceiving and fat without eating? And just, just so you know, it is funnier in Babylonian. So <laughs> I want you to lower your expectations. It's not going to, you're not going to do a spit take. Uh, I did not get it. because I pause. Think it, what? A pause. Right, that's pretty good. Oh, that's, see, that's, that's better. Good. That's better. You should have been. It, no, it's a rain cloud. I guess so they, they thought of rain clouds as getting pregnant and fat. So, uh, but I get the point, the reason I put that in was just to show riddles have been, and that's probably the oldest form of puzzle. Those have been around for millennia. But then you, all, you also have like a 16th century chess problem in there, the one with the four knights. Uh, yeah, there's sort of, and obviously mazes, we have mazes going back hundreds of years. And I guess the question is, what is it about puzzles uh, that's so fundamental within human nature that all these different societies across thousands of years have had to kind of invent them to drive themselves nuts. Uh, yeah, I think what Rabbi Lightstone said is true. Like we have, we are wired to want to solve puzzles. And the first puzzle was, of course, uh, you know, how do you eat? What do you find to eat and and make with? Uh, so that was the first puzzle, and uh, I think evolution has just uh, given us this desire to figure things out, and and I think uh, you know it's it's the it, it encourages a creative thinking, and you know the wheel was a solution to a puzzle, fire was a solution to a puzzle. So that's that is the way I see it, and actually since this event has a bit of a Jewish flavor, 
I, there was, when I was writing The Year of Living Biblically, I had a question uh, about inter biblical interpretation, because there is a line in, I believe it's Leviticus, and we have rabbis here who can correct me, but it was, the line is about, if two men are in a fight, and the wife of one of the men grabs the private parts of the other man, then her hand shall be cut off. And I, I was baffled. This was like, this seemed a very strange rule. So I asked, uh, I think it was a Chabad rabbi actually, and I said, well, what's going on here? Well, why is this in the Bible? And he said, well, it's not about that. It's about, it, it's about don't embarrass people. You know, show them where you don't embarrass, be thinking of other people. And I was like, that seems totally reasonable, but why didn't they just say that instead of this stuff about like grabbing private parts? And he said, well, listen, if you were given a jigsaw puzzle and it was fully solved, would that be fun? No. So the Bible is like a puzzle and you have to solve it. So that is a very interesting metaphor. Uh, I, I don't know, you know what I think, whether I 100% buy it, but I think it's an interesting point. Yeah, there, there's sort of almost like a musar, like an ethics of puzzles that, that crops up again and again um, in your book, right? The question of like, what makes a puzzle fair? What is a puzzle too hard? Um, now there's a one point where you, you're designing sort of a, a puzzle, a sequence of puzzles for your wife's uh, sort of puzzle event related business. And you realize that you're not, that, yeah, you said you're not sort of sadistic enough to be a puzzle maker. Because for you, you didn't like seeing people in pain because of your puzzles, right? There was, but in order to be like a puzzle maker, you have to have a certain comfort for that, for driving people kind of a little bit nuts. But also you can't drive them too nuts. Right. Um, so yeah, just the sort of puzzle ethics. What, it, what, what is sort of a good, what can we learn from them? And what's a good sort of ethic to bring to the puzzles of both the New York Times and everyday life. Yeah, I love that, and I totally agree. I am not cut out to be a puzzle maker, because you do have to have a certain level of sadism. You want the people to suffer, you want them to be frustrated, but you want them to have that ending point, the aha moment. Uh, and uh, so it's a sweet spot, and in fact, one of the people I interviewed for my book uh, is named Paul Bloom, who's a Yale psychologist who wrote a book called The Sweet Spot, and it was all about why do humans like painful things? Why do we voluntarily run triathlons, solve crossword puzzles, you know, S&M, not, not me in particular, <laughs> not, I have no moral problem with it, it just seems to involve too much equipment for my years, so. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, why do people do that? And, uh, and he believed that partly it's a drive that, you know, we are rewarded. We have to work to get food, work to get fire, work to... So we are um, evolved to like a little pain. We want the challenges so that we can get to the end. Uh, so yeah, people... People do like, and I'm one of them. I have a masochistic streak. I like to be in pain and then be released from that pain. But I don't like the other side as much. I just don't have the constitution, which is irrational because I know that people enjoy it and I'm one of them, but I just can't do it. Uh, so I have to, thankfully, there are a lot of sadistic people out there who are willing to fill that gap. All right, so there's some sort of prompt on the Zoom, and I think my mom will kill me if I don't see what it is. Whatever. Wait, should we do some? Uh, we can do some riddles if you want. We can do the interactive part. Sure. Well, I guess kind of to ease into that, because um, we have some great Jewish riddles that we want to that we want to talk, like some really good ones that did not make the book, and that only you all are going to get to hear about. <laughs> you all, and also centuries of Jews. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so what is sort of the connection between Judaism and, and puzzles in your mind? Is there a way that one is kind of a natural fit with the other, would you say? Well, I would say there is an overlap. I think 
Judaism is a lot about asking questions. That's one of my favorite parts of Judaism is, you know, it's, you, you see it in the rituals, the four questions, and you see it in, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea that wrestling with the Torah is uh, considered a good thing. And, uh, and even wrestling with God, as in the Bible, or in, with an angel. Uh, I also think that the inter interrogative, that's how you pronounce it, right? Is, like, I love, that is my favorite type of sentence, the interrogative. And I do think it is the most Jewish type of sentence. Uh, because, uh, you know, we use it in, in our rituals, but also, like, Jewish culture, like Seinfeld, is all about, you know, what is the deal with X? Like, that is an interrogative. So I do think uh, there's a large overlap there. Um, and uh, I also think, uh, yeah, you, and you've seen it throughout puzzle history, like Stephen Sondheim, uh, he, yes, he was a Broadway legend, but he was also a brilliant puzzler, and he changed puzzle history and introduced the United States to British crossword puzzles. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you see it throughout puzzle history. You see some, some great Jews. Uh, and, uh, and then the other thing was what I mentioned earlier about the puzzle of the, the Talmud and the Bible and, and the grabbing of the private parts, things like that. <laughs> we have, well, you have on you a couple of riddles that are actually from the Talmud. Actually, more than you have, like, four of them. Uh, one from the Mishnah, Three from the Gemara, um, and yeah, I mean, a couple of them are, you know, look, it, it, from the Aramaic to the English, it's sort of a bit, of a, maybe a bit of a rough kind of translation, but you know, it's it's interesting that the rabbis were kind of thinking in terms of of some of this stuff. So yeah, let's let's hear, let's hear a couple. All right, well, let's see. This is not from the Bible. I think this is a Yiddish, just a, like a traditional Yiddish puzzle, uh, but I'd like to see if. Folks can solve it. Hold on. It is. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying these are hilarious. These are, they're better than the Babylonian, but I'm just, just to manage your expectations a little. How many bagels can you eat on an empty stomach? How many bagels can you eat on an empty stomach? Any idea? Yes? One. Eight. And why? Oh, she's good. Yeah, but what if you say you have like six bagels in your mouth at once? Well, that's why you would be a great rabbi <laughs> asking these kinds of questions. <laughs> um, this one I like. This one definitely not funny, but I feel it's wise. Uh, what is the hardest thing in the world to recognize your own faults? What is the easiest thing in the world to criticize others and recognize their faults? I like that. That feels to me like a nice message. Again, not hilarious. All right, how about this one? This one is, I think, I didn't think this, was this one in the tablet? I don't think it was. Um, a man had dreamed he was sailing on a ship with his father and mother. The ship is sinking. The man can only save himself and one other person. He wants to save both his father and his mother. What should he do? I feel Elke knows. I feel you, you want to say it, but you don't want to. Go ahead. Wake up. He should wake up. That started man was dreaming. And I love that, because the lesson is, you know, yeah, you know, stop dreaming. It's very practical. It feels like a Jewish mother, like, wake up. Uh, all right, how about this one? A man, the Jews were in the desert, and Joshua saw a man working on the Sabbath on Shabbat. Joshua found out the man's name and wrote it down so he could report it to Moses. What is wrong with this picture? Well, he wasn't supposed to write down the name. Yeah, you're not supposed to write it, so that's a little paradox. That's actually a paradox I had in the year of living biblically, because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. But I was writing, my work was to write a book about following the rules of the Bible. So by not working on the Sabbath, I was working. <laughs> uh, all right, this one I do believe is in either the Talmud or somewhere. What? <laughs> this one requires uh, knowledge of like you know third century uh, uh, zoology. Oh, this was slaves in the ancient world. 
yeah, but I think it's interesting. So what animal has one voice when it's alive and seven voices when it's dead? And the end, I won't make you that. It's the ibis, which is a type of bird, because apparently you could make seven different types of musical instruments out of the carcass of the ibis. Obvious. So from where it is. Yeah, a drum, the beak was a flute, etc. Uh, all right, how about, what else did we have, Arvin? We had another couple. Uh, well, we do have the one from the Bible uh, that Samson did. I, all right, I'll tell it quickly, because again, this one, to me, Samson may have had a lot of other positive uh, traits, but riddles were not his strong point. Because uh, he said, out of the eat, he said to a bunch of Philistines, uh, he asked, out of the eater comes something to eat, and out of the strong comes something sweet. What is it? What is he talking about? Does anyone remember? Okay, you are a star student. I don't know. Because basically, in the carcass of a lion that uh, he had taken over to form a colony. Exactly. She got it. Let's see. That was impressive. Let's see. And I will say, this is an example of a totally unfair puzzle. Like, because this is something that Samson had seen, and Samson could answer it, but no one else had seen it. Well, maybe, but presumably, no one else had seen it. Uh, all right, so those are some Jewish riddles. Uh, so the book ends with you commissioning what's called a generation puzzle, which is a puzzle that is so difficult and has so many possibilities uh, and so few solutions that it would in fact take longer than a single human life to solve it. Um, and in the book, you talk about puzzles as a way of kind of like glimpsing eternity, but also understanding uh, you know, our own kind of puny size in the universe, but also understanding our own capabilities and uh, kind of, uh, you know, how, how big we can be at the same time within the small, our own smallness within the universe. Um, so I guess the question is, how much progress have you made on the generation puzzle that you commissioned, which I think is like a, a tower with lots of pegs and you're supposed to unlock all the pegs, but it would take like 4,000 years to do it or something like that. So how, how's that going? Uh, first of all, and second of all, has any of that sort of changed your own view of the composition of reality and the cosmos and so on? Uh, well, yes, I'm very proud of that. And it actually has a biblical name. The name of the puzzle is Jacob's Ladder. And uh, I commissioned this Dutch puzzle designer because I love the idea of generational puzzles, because I love the idea of passing along an heirloom and going generation to generation. And these are puzzles so far can't solve them in one lifetime. And this one is, this one holds officially the record for the hardest puzzle ever created. Actually, most time consuming to be precise, because as Armin said, you have to twist the pegs and you have to twist them 1.2 decillion times. So if you do one per second, the universe will end in a heat death uh, before you are able to solve this. So I was very proud of it, and I have not solved it. But like Armin said, I love the metaphorical part of it, because one, I love the idea of thinking uh, to future generations, which is actually, I think, a Jewish idea, like you know, the uh, descendants. And I love the idea of big numbers, because I think we don't think about big numbers enough. We just can't comprehend them, but they're very important. And it's why uh, COVID spread, like it spread exponentially and it spread so fast. No one, you know, uh, certainly I couldn't comprehend or uh, predict how fast it would spread. And, uh, and I also like the idea of, of working on a puzzle knowing that it will never be solved because one of the people I talked to, he was not Jewish, he was a Japanese puzzle maker, the godfather of Sudoku, he was called. And he said that puzzles and life can be represented in three symbols, the question mark, the arrow, the exclamation point. So the question mark is you get there and you're like, what's going on? The arrow is you trying to figure it out. And it's more like this kind of thing than an arrow. But uh, 
And then the exclamation point is the aha moment uh, when you figure it out. But you know, but as he said, you know, in life, you know, when we get to the exclamation point, and you gotta love that arrow or whatever crazy, curvy path it is. And and this puzzle, you're never gonna get to the exclamation point. So you might as well enjoy the meditative joy of just like turning those pegs. All right, so one very last one before you quiz the crowd. And this, this gives you an idea of what it's like when I interview people for articles. It's always like a 15 last questions. <laughs> uh, but do you have a favorite puzzle that you have ever solved and, and why? Uh, well, I, I have a lot of different favorite puzzles. Um, all right, got to pick them. Well, this one I didn't solve, but I do think that this one I included in the book. It was a spot the difference puzzle, and it appeared in the Baltimore Sun about two years ago, and it was a picture of, of a boy brushing his teeth, but and then underneath it it had another boy brushing his teeth, and you were supposed to find the difference, spot the difference. So they printed that, and then. The next day, they had to print the correction saying, we apologize, the two images in the spot the difference puzzle were actually identical. <laughs> so we apologize to those who, so to me, in my darker moments, I actually don't believe this, but I think in my darker moments when I think that, that you know, maybe life is totally futile, like this seems like a good metaphor, but I actually do think that there, there is a meaning to life, and you can spot the difference. But I just thought it was such a beautiful, like, hilarious metaphor. All right, so what's the first thing we should throw at the crowd? Not me. I'm not, I'm not in the crowd, to be clear, for the purpose of this exercise. I have a couple, uh, a couple of genres of puzzles that I thought might be fun for, uh, for audience participation. All right, first, let's start with one called Ditloid. It's a little bit of an obscure, but what it is is a, a phrase that starts with a number and then it has letters and you have to figure out what the letters stand for. So I'll give you an example. 5,280 F in an M is 5,280 feet in a mile. It is the M, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so you get it? Yeah. Okay. So here, I'll give you a few and, and just shout it out if you know it. Uh, 20,000 L under the S. Leave that. Nice. 2,000 P in a T. Pounds in a ton. Nice. Uh, 52 C in a D. Yeah. Oh, you guys are too fast. We're going to go through these real hard. Uh, well, this one's a little hard. 206 B in the HB, 206, generally thought to be 206. Bones in the human body. Yes, exactly. Bones in the human body. 14 D in an F, 14 D in an F. Oh, good. 14 days in a fortnight. Hey, he got it. Oh. All right, how about... 31F uh, at BR. 31 flavors of Baskin Robbins. Yeah. You're too good. You're too good. All right, well, let me give you these. Let me try. This is a, this is a type of puzzle that actually my wife introduced me to. Uh, and, uh, and we play it with the kids, I think. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned your wife. She's in the book. Is she a, is she a better puzzler than you, would you say? Because she is a professional puzzle designer, basically. She's a part of the puzzle industry. Did you, did you two ever sort of like mash wits over the course of, of this book? Uh, well, she is, I mean, as I said to you, I do believe the word puzzle is there are so many types of puzzles. And so, uh, you know, like you say you don't like puzzles, but I do believe it's like dating. There's going to there's gonna be a puzzle that you like. So she is better at certain types. She's better at jigsaws than I am. Uh, she's better at certain types of word puzzles, but I'm better at others. So that's okay. Uh, that's my diplomatic way of saying it. We both are good and are our own player. Okay, so the name of this game is Men in Black Swan. 
Men in Black Swamp. Yeah. So you play the game. I'm going to describe the plot of a movie, and you have to guess what the movie is. But the twist is, the movie is a mashup of two titles that share the same word. So it's just before and after, like Wheel of Fortune. And... Yeah, kind of before and after with movies. So two sunglasses wearing members of a secret organization that polices extraterrestrials end up joining the New York City Ballet Company. So that one would be Men in Black Swan. Men in Black Swan. Exactly. Oh. So does that get does that make sense? All right. So here, let me give you a few. Um, a huge canine who rules the plains of Africa must overcome his stutter for a big presentation. The Lion King speech. Yeah. Cody? Is it Cody? John. Oh, John. That's Kobe right there. Oh, Kobe. Oh, okay, John. So. Uh, Yes, you are good. You are good. All right, how about, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Jennifer Garner stars as a teenager who becomes an adult in order to bankrupt a Las Vegas casino. Ocean's Wow. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> All right, I'll give another couple hints. How about, uh, oh, this one. All right, a sloth and a woolly mammoth. Uh, it's, this one was about a sloth and a woolly mammoth's romantic adventures among upper class uh, New York in the 1870s. I did it. Uh, like Ice Age, yeah, that's good. Ice Age of... Innocence. What? Innocence. Yeah, exactly. Ice Age of Innocence. The, uh, did you remember that? Does anyone? The Winona Ryder? Scorsese. Yeah, it was good. I actually just watched it recently. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, all right, we'll do one more. Uh, <laughs> well, this one... <laughs> This one a friend of mine wrote, so if it's in bad taste, please blame him. Uh, a best-selling writer is kidnapped, and it's up to her roguish adventurer boyfriend and the wrongly accused Atlanta Olympics bomber to find her. It was, I think it was an HBO movie, it was not a huge thing. Yeah, I think the second part is Richard Jewell, but I'm not going to yes. remember. <laughs> it was, and it's a sequel where a best-selling writer is kidnapped and her boyfriend has to find her. So, yes, Richard Jewell is the first part. Richard Jewell. Right, that's the second. But now you're looking for Richard Jewell of... Love the Nile. Love the Nile. Richard Jewell of the Nile. I'm trying to think of something, something Richard Jewell. That's it. Yeah. Uh, all right, so those are some, uh, those are some titles that you want to find in the Great puzzling community. What's sort of the reaction been to your book in the puzzling community? Because that's another sort of interesting theme in the book is that there are a lot of people out there who dedicate a ton of not just like brain power, but emotional investment in solving some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, even to an unhealthy degree, uh, sort of this like amusing kind of couple pages you dedicate to this book called Masquerade, uh, published in Britain in the 70s that had people uh, literally digging up, like trespassing onto like historical sites to dig looking for this golden rabbit. Um, and in a way, when you write a book about puzzles, almost those are the people that you are kind of up against uh, in a sense. Yeah, what, what's the reaction been among among sort of the puzzling world, let's say. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'll show, get a visual prop here. I, Ooh, is, is it the Golden Rabbit? It's, it's oh, it's the, the book. Rabbit. It's just the book. But yeah, I, I was very nervous because puzzle people are amazing nitpickers. They are, you know, if you make a mistake, you are going to hear about it. So I fact checked it like three times, and, and luckily it has been like, you know, I'm. I've gotten very little, if any, negative feedback. It's been very well received by the puzzle. But uh, it almost wasn't because the cover 
uh, was designed. And as you can see there, the crossword puzzle on the cover. So originally they did another crossword puzzle. The artist is not a professional crossword maker. So he just put a bunch of random black squares on a white grid. And uh, it wasn't symmetrical. It didn't have, you know, it had two letter words. And I didn't even notice. I put it up on Facebook and the puzzle people went bananas. They were like, this is an outrage. This is not a proper puzzle. Like they said, you're going to end up on not a puzzle Twitter feed, <laughs> which is an actual Twitter feed devoted. Shame. Yeah, it would have been a Shonda. And it would have been, but this, it's hilarious that there is an entire Twitter feed devoted to artists who make crossword puzzles that are not proper crossword puzzles, like in advertisements. So, uh, so I begged my editor, like, we can't go out there with this, we'll be, we'll be killed. And, and we were able to change it. So that was a close call. And then the book itself is sort of aimed at, at the puzzlers in the sense that the book, the book has a puzzle to which there is an answer uh, hidden, embedded, much like the golden rabbit except uh, you know, not involving uh, any sort of uh, damage to physical space, hopefully. Um, and you were saying earlier beforehand that someone actually has solved the kind of larger meta puzzle in The Puzzler. Um, and I don't know if you'd say it, but sort of what, who was it? How did they do it? Have you, got, have you gotten to talk to this person? Were you impressed? Were you actually kind of disappointed in a way? Were you hoping that this book would be one of those puzzles that went unsolved for 100 years? Uh, yeah, originally I wanted to do a puzzle that would take years to solve, but my friend who's a puzzler said, no, you can't, if it's a fair puzzle, there are puzzle people out there who will solve it in 10 minutes, or it will never be solved. So we had to set it up in a way that it would actually last. So we released one puzzle. Once you find the hidden code in the introduction, you put it into a website, and we released one puzzle every day on the website. And these were crazy hard puzzles. And a few thousand people signed up, 400 made it through all the puzzles. And once you get there, then we had the finals about a month ago, and we released five puzzles at, at noon. And by like 12.30, someone had solved all the five puzzles, which were crazy hard. They would like take me a day and a half to solve one of them. Uh, but he, had a team of people that were all solving with him at the same time. His name is Ben Nguyen. And these are people, I have a chapter in the book about the MIT mystery hunt, which is like the Iron Man triathlon of puzzling. It's 72 hours every year where the smartest people, uh, where the craziest people come and they solve hundreds of puzzles to find a penny hidden somewhere on the MIT campus. So these people, like they, that's what, that is their true passion. And they have, you know, spreadsheets and they have all sorts of strategies. So they were the ones who solved it, the $10,000. And I was happy, I, I wanted someone to solve it. Uh, like I said, you can't, it, it would be very hard to make a puzzle that lasts, that would be fun for people. And the, the, the puzzle in the book that kind of has lasted the longest is the, the last sort of column of the cryptos thing in the, the CIA headquarters. And you interviewed the artist um, who managed to create a code that like no computer has been able to crack and that no human being has seemed to make all that much progress on. Um, do you think it'll ever be solved? And did he tell you kind of how you did it, how he did it? And was there part of you that thought, yeah, I could come up with like a crypt something that's even even harder enough to crack than cryptos to, to kind of close my book out. Yeah, well, the the true believers in cryptos think that it will be solved. So they're like, you know, some kid that's going to come up with a solution. Uh, others are skeptical that it's you know he either made a mistake or it's a hoax. I will say the most brilliant part of this is that the sculptor Jim Sanborn. If you think you have the solution to this puzzle, you can email him your solution, and he will respond yes or no. But uh, he will charge you $50 for a response. So he 
as I say in the book, he might be the highest paid writer in America. Because he just, like, you know, he'll probably get five or ten guesses a day, and he just writes no, and then he does five, you know, whatever it is, five hundred dollars. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, but, that, but my big takeaway was, again, I love the community that has formed about it, because there's a lot in the book about community, and these puzzles bring people together, and, and that is one thing I love about it. Well, luckily, we're charging zero dollars to ask uh, the great A.J. Jacobs a question. And I just realized that, that we should, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, anyone, uh, let's, let's hear it. He's got, he's got a question for the puzzler. Hi. Yep. Um, after immersing yourself in all the puzzles and you know, riddles, and you make a game into all some of that. So, so do you feel like it helps you solve like your day-to-day -day real life of, like questions? I do. Thank you for asking, Rivka. Uh, I actually totally buy into that idea that puzzles help you be a better thinker, a better, even a better person, better citizen. And uh, and I have a few examples in the book of like real life problems that we solve. But I think even more than that, just the meta idea of looking at the world as a puzzle has helped me. So, for instance. I call it the puzzler mindset. So if I'm in an argument with someone from the other side of the political spectrum, you know, I'm an Upper West Side liberal, so if I'm in a discussion with a Trump supporter, uh, my, my default would be to try to like, you know, berate them and like, you know, present them with facts and beat them down and they try the same. And that rarely works. In fact, it often backfires. So instead, my, my new strategy is to try to treat conversations like that as a puzzle. And almost, um, you know, the puzzle is what do we disagree on? What is the crux of our disagreement? Why do we disagree on it? Is there evidence that could change either of our minds? Uh, and where do we go from here? And all of those are puzzles that you can solve together in an almost, as a, instead of an adversarial, it's almost like a cooperative adventure and that, to me, has yielded much more interesting and less infuriating conversations. So, uh, and that is actually, that is one of the, the lessons in the book is uh, a psych child psychologist once told me to, uh, don't be furious, don't get furious, get curious. Yeah. And I love that. So I try to apply it to everything. Any other posts? Yes. Thank you for that answer. It's very Thank you for the question. So, hey, do you, at what point do you think AI will start becoming a part of puzzles and if humans will start using the computer's action to make our puzzles and we'll see them to solve it, right? It seems like humans are just going to become kind of obsolete. Yeah, no, it is a very good question and I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm, there was just recently a guy who said that he programmed an AI to make crossword puzzles. But the crossword people were like, no, you just made the worst kind of crossword. Like, it doesn't have a theme, it's not clever. Uh, and then there's the big debate in Sudoku. I have a chapter in the book about Sudoku. Because you can program a computer to make a Sudoku, you know, a million in a second. But the true Sudoku creative masters, like the Michelangelo's of Sudoku, they claim that those Sudokus like, I interviewed this guy, and he's like, he was literally, they have no soul. What I do is like a master, you know, an art that has heart and tells a story and has, uh, and has passion. And I honestly cannot tell the difference. But I did talk to the people who are Sudoku fanatics who do say that they can tell the difference between a computer generated and a human, which I like. You know, I want to cling to that, even if it, you know, it may or may not be true, because, you know, in like 10 years, I'm sure an AI will be able to write like a quirky nonfiction book, and then I'll be out of the job. Like solving. Like, oh, solving. You know, at some point, with um, AI, like, you know, there's going to be some kind of program. Right, right. Well, that is, I mean, 
With okay. Wordle, the AI that I read about, it had the first word is, the best first word is soar, S-O-A-R-E, a type of young, which is a word for a young hawk. And I, I use that and I don't feel good about it. I feel like it really, I just feel terrible every time I do it. But you know, I mean, AI already can solve, and, and a lot of the hidden codes, there's a famous code called the Zodiac Killer Code, who was a serial killer, and he sent the police notes in code, and one of them was just solved with the help of AI. Right now, it seems like we're in a phase where AI and computers uh, working, I mean, AI and humans working together is the best, but that may seem, you would know better than me, you should be answering. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think, I, I, I think AI has a long way to go. Like, like, I mean, AI is like, you know, making things like, obviously AI is making huge progress, but like, I, I think, you know, that, that there's still a lot of things that humans can do like, really well that like AI. <laughs> Good oh, for humans. I, yeah. Good for humans. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of a follow-up to that. I wonder if you've looked at it. You, you mentioned there's a chess puzzle you, you look at in the book, and the chess engines have certainly gotten to a level where it's like grandmasters learn from the engines of right. new things to do. And I wonder, there's been a huge boom in chess over the past few years. A lot of people were stuck inside in COVID and pick it back up. So I wonder if that intersects with... Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. for that chapter, I... I uh, I interviewed, I had uh, Gary Kasparov come to my apartment. And he first of all, he insulted my chessboard. <laughs> this is a very cheap chessboard. It's plastic. Let's call it. <laughs> it's like, sorry. Uh, but then he said, I grew up in the Soviet Union and I'm used to cheap chessboards. So he kind of let me off the hook. He, I asked him a lot about AI, and he uh, is more optimistic about humans. Uh, future than some other people I talked to. So he he believes, he says, look, I was the first person to have their, first knowledge worker to have their job replaced by an AI because he was famously beaten by Big Blue, the computer program uh, in, what was it, the 90s? Uh, so he's like, so I'm the first person, but even I think that AIs will never replace humans because uh, you know we have heart, we have emotion, and we can, we can tell stories. He says that AI is better than that, and he, and that humans at chess and at solving chess puzzles. Yeah. And partly that's because a lot of chess puzzles require you to do things that are so counterintuitive and counter to, they just feel bad. You have to sacrifice a queen to win. And he's like, humans just, it feels weird to sacrifice a queen because we're so emotionally attached to the queen. Whereas the AI is like, I don't care. My mom says just numbers, I'm sacrificing the queen, no problem. So there is a chess problem. These chess problems are, it's a certain arrangement on the board and you have to move um, them so that white checkmates black. And there was one, the, the hardest one is like over 500 moves for white to checkmate black. And he said he watched, Gary Kasparov said he watched a computer solve this one, and that he was amazed because he had no idea what the computer was doing for the first 450 moves. And he was like, well, what is going on? And then he finally, it sort of clicked. So yeah, uh, we are in trouble. If, if it's all about chess and go and that kind of thing, then AI is, is definitely going to uh, take over. But hopefully there are areas where humans still are going to be. Uh, you know, we won't be, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'll still be needed. <laughs> and if I use a chess engine to play online, yeah, they're going to ban my account. It's an achievement. Yeah. Like, if it's an AI, that's very nice, but, you know, the whole point is a Picasso painted by AI would not be Picasso. Right. No, I love that. That's a great point. But still, it seems that, to me, there's something about the fact that only a human can do it. And maybe that's a, a flaw of my thinking. But, like, you know, that's why I prefer crosswords to Sudoku, is because I know a Sudoku, you know, a computer can make a Sudoku. Maybe not the most brilliant Sudoku, but, uh, 
great crossword puzzles still require that human touch. Yeah. Now, uh, before we had um, a discussion before the, the lecture um, about whether your eyes are life or not, and um, you know, we're just wanting to, uh, from a Jewish perspective, uh, throw an idea that in the act of creation, uh, there's mineral, minerals, and then um, plants, and then animals, and then humans, and um, the the light closest to the light of Creator is the mineral. In a sense, what we did with AI computers is make a mineral thing. So in a sense, it's closer to, to the light of God, and therefore somehow there may be some kind of superiority in, in the thinking process. Now, it's a different thinking process. Now, wait a minute, can I just bring in uh, Rabbi Lightstone? Because he, <laughs> this is his department. He has an interesting point earlier on. Because I was trying to argue that yes, an AI could be Jewish. But uh, I thought it was a fun thing to argue. But you had an interesting point about the golem. So I think, yeah. So the, um, the earliest reference, the golem, uh, people know famous of the golem of Prague, there was a, a golem in, in Helm as well, didn't end up as well. Um, the and does Prague. everyone know the golem? Yes, yeah. yeah, so there's um, the next level. Um, so the, the golem in, uh, is referenced in the Talmud, speaking about a rabbi, first it says that he would make a calf, a special type of, you know, the best meat um, for Shabbat, he'd take this calf, and because it was created with the golem, he wouldn't need to, um, you know, do any special slaughtering, you know, it wasn't actually alive, so therefore it would be kosher to eat from the go. Um, That's like lab grown meat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, comes into the discussion as well, the halachic, um, legalistic take on that. Um, and then when it comes to robots as well, to understand robots, we have to look at the discussion around golems, both because it's fun to talk about golems, and it's probably the best paradigm that exists with actual discussion in Jewish law around how a golem would function. And finally, and interestingly, um, the word robot itself comes from a word in Czech, and the um, Slavic robot to work, to do something. Um, and famously, the famous golem is from Prague, and very likely the play, Rur, which stands for, I think, Rosamund's Robots, or something like that, um, the play that coined that term probably took it from the Golem. In any event, so in this Talmudic discussion around the Golem, um, it says that one rabbi created a Golem, who a humanoid, to visit another rabbi and to deliver some sort of message to him. And in the process of sending the Golem over uh, one person to the other, so the second rabbi saw him and said, you're not really you know, a person, you know, go back to the dust, you know, you know destroy yourself, Deactivate and golem fell apart. So there's a debate in the Talmud if you make um, a golem, would the golem be Jewish or not? And so the Chacham Tzvi, uh, famous rabbi from the uh, 16th century, 17th century, I believe, um, he said that um, it would make sense to say the golem is Jewish. Why would it make sense to say the golem is Jewish? Because there's a rule that whoever teaches somebody is as if they gave birth to them. If you have a really good teacher, a teacher who profoundly impacts you, in a way that really alters the trajectory of your life, you're like a parent, they have a special role and special meaning to you. So therefore, if you make a goal by a big holy rabbi, you know, has all the intense, you know, uh, you know, Kabbalistic thoughts going on, maybe that, ra uh, that goal that he makes would be like he gave birth because he taught it, and you know, therefore it would be a living thing. Um, and the answer, uh, being his answer, there's others uh, around this, but his son argues with him, um, but the answer is that it couldn't be that this golem was actually alive. Why? Because the second rabbi destroyed the golem in the Talmud. And if he destroyed it, then it means it has no purpose. You don't destroy something, you know, it could be used for something else. So surely had the golem been able to become alive, therefore become Jewish, they would have kept it in a closet somewhere. And if they needed a minion, they needed ten people to pray, they would have pulled it out and said, you know, here's a talus, you know, start dogging bot. Um, the fact that they didn't do it means that it could never become fully human. That's kind of a discussion over there. So a minion to make a minion? Not yet. <laughs> but there won't be a robotic Rosh Hashiva. Yeah. I, 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 we don't even like, but I, I will say with GPT-3, with the AI, you can say make a Shabbat speech like a Shabbat rabbi, and it's it's very real, actually. <laughs> 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 you feel threatened? You feel your job? Not yet. No soulmate. <laughs> 
right? There's no, no robotic to shop in the future. Yet discovered. Um, anyone else? I've got a question. It's kind of a nerdy question. So I, I, I haven't finished the book yet. I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, I'm a programmer, computer programmer. Um, did you talk to any complexity theorists? No, I did. I, I I listened to some podcasts about the plastic. Okay. But well, tell me more. Uh, what what should I've asked, and what should I include in the next edition? Yeah. So uh, so complexity theory is a branch of theoretical computer science which tries to understand why things are hard, like why problems are hard. It tries to classify problems. So like it explains with like mathematical rigor, like why this problem is harder than this problem, or why this problem might be equivalent in complexity to this problem. So for example, like solving a Rubik's Cube might be easier than playing chess. Like they could explain mathematically why. And one of the interesting things about complexity theory is that um, the biggest puzzle is that um, there's this big mathematical conjecture called P versus NP, which basically captures the intuition that um, solving a puzzle is harder than checking the answer, right? So like, if, yeah, right? So like, you know, obviously, like, uh, it, it seems obvious to all of us, right? Like, doing a crossword takes me longer than checking to see if I, you know, if, I, if you give me a filled out crossword, I could check very quickly if, like, it, you know, it works. But it's a lot harder to find the answer. So it turns out that, like, this sort of obvious, like intuition is a complete is like completely like an open mathematical problem. Like we're we're trying to prove everyone who's tried to prove that this is true has like failed. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that it's not true, which would mean that like there could be like a like an algorithm that exists that like renders most hard problems just super easy. And the whole complexity hierarchy would collapse. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. I also think that sometimes checking the answer is harder, especially yeah. like in puzzle books, trying to find the page sure, yeah. that the answer is on. Uh, I also love that, that there is some quantification to it because I had so many, whenever I interviewed someone, it's about their particular type of puzzle. They were always like, Sudoku is hard, is harder than chess. It's got more. Right, right. And backgammon, I interviewed a backgammon champ, and he's like, so much more complicated than chess. And I was well, like, that's maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but now we can check. Yeah. <laughs> so there would be a, a, a way to mathematically check. Yes, there definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I have to ask one more question, oh, if you don't mind. Um, so I feel like with many of your books, and an announcement afterwards, uh, but with many of your books, the books somehow impact you, so to speak. And it, I, I know it's a thread where some things from one book carry on to the next. Because I imagine you invest yourself so much in the book, and you live the experience, then you kind of take something away. For example, I see the thing thankfulness, you know, from your building biblically, then moved out to your next book, and right. things like that. Uh, so I'm curious, number one, how has the world of puzzles impacted you somehow towards the future influenced you? And then part two is, what are you working on next? Well, yeah, I think it definitely had several impacts, some of which I've mentioned. But I guess one of the big, you know, sort of overarching impacts is that it, you know, I do, I love curiosity, and I feel that those are my two favorite, I don't know whether you call them drives or emotions, but gratitude and curiosity, those are my two favorite. Uh, so, um, so I would say that that is, uh, I, I, you know, I'll continue, all of my books are in a sense about curiosity, but, uh, but now I'm totally enamored of it, and, uh, and, and also another way it's impacted me is that puzzles are very solution-oriented, you know, you, there is almost always a solution, except for that Baltimore Sunspot difference puzzle. Okay. And, uh, and I don't think that always happens in life, but I think that it's very helpful to go through life thinking, yes, there is, there's not one perfect solution, there's a bunch of solutions, and some of them are better than others, but there are solutions out there. And I think when I read, of the news, 
a lot of it is, here's the problem, here's the problem, here's the problem. There's never any talk of potential solutions. So that has made me, it's made me much more solution oriented. And there is actually, there's something called the Solutions Journalism Network, which is all about trying to find, do more articles about solutions, and I support that. Um, and as for my next project, I, that is a puzzle, as uh, I like to say. I haven't, uh, I have a few half-baked ideas, but I haven't settled on one yet. But if anyone has an idea, then, uh, you know, maybe like the golem, maybe there's something there. That was fascinating. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was a delight. And, uh, and congratulations on the uh, on the series because this is just the first of, of several. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, AJ. This was awesome. One major theme of the evening is that the book's fantastic. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's extremely frustrating, but not too frustrating. Just the way that good puzzles should be. The book isn't. The puzzles are, but they should. Be. They're designed to be. Well, that's high praise because I know you're not. A, you know, you're a puzzle skeptic. So. Yeah, I, I, I tried. I tried a couple, and then uh, was uh, suitably humbled. Um, but yeah, it's it's great. It's worth getting your hands on. Please do it. Thanks so much for coming. Come to the other. Come to the other nine of these. I'm sure they're going to also be fantastic. And uh, Rabbi, here you go. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, in terms of housekeeping, number one, afterwards we have boozy ice cream, meaning it has a low alcohol content, but it is delicious with various flavors um, like lemonana, with vodka, I think, and uh, rosé and strawberries, and all kinds of things like that. So um, if you're willing to get a little bit of a bump, and that's okay, we have over there. Um, and as well, the next 12X talk is going to be in September. Exact date will be announced. And that's going to be with Miriam Elder, who is the former executive editor at Vanity Fair High, which is now pursuing a independent project, and my friend uh, Rabbi David Margolin, and they're going to speak about Soviet Jewish identity and how that really applies to the world today and to us today and all kinds of other fun things like that. So keep your eyes out for that information, um, find out about that, and everything else with the tech tech website, which all of you went through to get here, so that's all said and done. They're both great. Yeah, both great. Great people, yes. Thank you all very much. Looking forward uh, to more to come, and enjoy some ice cream and some more sushi. I'm giving a little out of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.